Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome back to another virtual edition of Children's Church. Let's get to it. Back when our story began, Samuel, he wasn't even born yet. His mother Hannah was hoping for a son and eventually he comes along. And now a lot of time has passed and Samuel is now very, very old. So old, in fact, that his own sons have begun to judge Israel in his place because he was just too old to be doing it anymore. And um, things were not going very well. We are reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting at verse 1. When Samuel became old, really old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Kind of reminds me of Eli, right? His sons, they were priests, but they were kind of like, you know, important people, maybe not actual judges, but, um, you know, remember um, Hophni and Phinehas? And they were not followers of God. I mean, they technically were priests of God, but they didn't actually really believe in God and follow him and, you know, do the right thing. Hopefully Samuel's sons, because Samuel's a great guy, so hopefully his sons are much better. All right, verse three. Yet his sons, Samuel's sons, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain, they took bribes and perverted justice. Let's break this down. All right, so we have Joel and we have Abijah, and they are both sons of Samuel, and they are made judges over Israel. So they're kind of like rulers in Israel. They're not, they're not kings. They're not making all the decisions, but they do make some decisions, especially when something goes wrong. They decide what is the good thing to do? Or if somebody does something wrong, what they have to do as a punishment for that kind of a thing. Um, and they're supposed to be, you know, following God's law and directing the people to follow God's law as well. But they were not doing a good job at this at all. They were being bribed and persuaded left and right for the wrong thing. So let me give you an example. Let's say I was driving my car down the street, doo -doo, and then I wasn't paying attention. I veered off the side of the road and I ran over your mailbox that was hanging out at the end of your driveway, all right? So I just like totally took the mailbox out. Now, I made a mistake, right? I was in an accident and I damaged something of yours. So I should have to pay you back so that you can, you know, get a new mailbox and put it out there and all that kind of good stuff. Well, if Joel or Abijah were the judge in this case, I would go up to them and maybe slip them 20 bucks and say, you know, um, yeah, so I was driving and I was really distracted by this ugly mailbox and I decided that the world would be better if it no longer existed. So I ran over it. And obviously the people were like, see, he ran over, you, you, you and your family were like, he ran over our mailbox, he needs to fix it. Well, Joel or Abijah, because they got that $20 from me, they'd be like, ah, no, he's good. You're, you're gonna have to fix it yourself. Uh, that's a problem, right? Now, the, the things that people would do wrong in Israel were way bigger deal than running over a mailbox. But it's that same kind of concept that Joel and Abijah, they could be bribed with money or power or influence or whatever, and they wouldn't necessarily make good decisions that God wanted them to make. And that was a major problem. And it started to concern a lot of the other leaders in Israel. This reminds me of a song that you've never actually heard before, but you're gonna learn today. Show me all the money, but they still can't buy me. Cause I know Jesus is the only one he came. Jesus, you're the only one I'm looking for. Jesus, you're the only one who saved my soul. You give me love and joy and peace. And everything that I could ever need. I will 
will follow I'll follow you They can show me other money But they still can't buy me Cause I know Jesus is the only worthy king Jesus, you're the only one I'm looking for Jesus, you're the only one who saves my soul You give me love and joy and peace And everything that I could ever Jesus, you're the only one I'm looking for Jesus, you're the only one who saved my soul You give me love and joy and peace And everything that I could ever need. That I could ever need. All right, so back to the story. So we had um, Samuel's two sons that were now the judges, and they weren't doing a good job. Now, the other people who were leaders in Israel, they started to get pretty concerned. One, they were concerned because um, they were not living the same way that Samuel was living, which was definitely throwing up some red flags. But even more than that, right now, at that point in Israel's history, they were experiencing peace. They weren't at war with the Philistines at the moment. Things were going really well, and they wanted things to keep on going well. So the leaders of Israel, they decided what they needed was a king, like all the other countries and nations and people around them. Everyone else had these strong kings with strong armies. And they thought to themselves, you know what will keep us safe? A king. If we get a king, then just like these other places around us, we're going to have good, strong armies, and we're going to be safe and comfortable. And everything's going to be like we want it to be. Um, yeah, there was one big problem here. They wanted to put their trust in a person who was a king rather than putting their trust in God, the one true king who rules over all things, who is the creator of all things, who loves them. They decided that he wasn't enough. We are back in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now, appoint for us a king to judge us, like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. The people had rejected God as their king. He wasn't enough. They didn't trust in him. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. This is so sad, but at the same time, we kind of should be used to it by now. The people, they, they knew what God had done in the past. They had seen his miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt with the plagues and the, the parting of the Red Sea. I mean, God had saved them out of the hand of the Egyptians, saved them out of slavery, and gave them freedom. Yet, they still didn't fully trust him. And they wanted to be like all the other nations around them. So, they wanted a king. Not God's king, not God as king, but their own king, like the other nations, to protect them. And this made Samuel so very sad. But God told Samuel that if the people want a king like the other nations, then he will give them a king like the other nations. But that doesn't mean that um, it was going to be a king they would actually really want when push came to shove. So Samuel warns the people a few things that are going to happen if they get the king that they want, that they really don't want, but they do want. It's 
It's kind of like if you like, I don't know, if you talk to your parental units and we're like, hey, can you uh, let me eat a whole gallon of ice cream? Cause you want to eat a whole gallon of ice cream? And they're like, trust me, you don't want to eat a whole gallon of ice cream. They're like, no, I really do want ice cream, but you really don't want to eat a whole gallon of ice cream. It's gonna awful stomach ache. Like you're gonna be in the bathroom all night. It's not gonna be fun times at all. Um, but yeah, so that's this whole situation's coming here because they want the king, but trust me, you don't actually want this king that's like the other kings in these other nations. So some of the warnings, one, he warns the people that this king will take their sons away and put them into the army, make them go into his armies to build his chariots so he can be strong. Chariots at that time, they were like a source of strength. Like today we might talk about like, you know, having more weapons and tanks and bombs and all those kinds of things. Well, back in the day, if you had chariots and more horses and that kind of stuff, that meant you were very strong and powerful. So not only would they be able to, you know, fight against other enemies that might, you know, want to go to battle, but also the king would make sure that they know that he was very powerful and, you know, don't mess with him because he's got big armies, so I'd be a little scared. And then two, he would uh, take stuff from them in the form of taxes. He would make them pay stuff to the king just because he was their king. Like say they, um, you know, they were farmers and they made, 10 tons of grain one season. I don't know how much grain or whatever, just go with it. Well, he would make them give a whole ton of that grain to the king just because he was the king. Not something that people enjoy paying taxes, but that's, that's the way it is. And then another thing, pretty much the worst thing is at the end of the day, the people would really just be like slaves to him. It'd be like they were back in Egypt, slaves to Pharaoh, except now they'd be slaves to this king that they think that they want, but they really don't want, but they really do want. And so Samuel warns the people, and this is their response right after a quick message from our sponsor. Today's video was brought to you by the letter C. As in what? C for crust. Oh, like pizza crust. No, like the crust in your eyes. You know, you get those little crusties. Yeah, C. So after Samuel warned the people about the things that would happen if they got a king like the other nations, this was their response. This is verse 18, 19. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us to fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. So the people, they decided that they wanted a king like the other nations. And they decided that it would be that king that would protect them from any harm. But they knew that the only person, the only thing they should put their trust in was God. That God should be their king. That he would be the one that would protect them just like he had protected them before. I mean, all this way, all through their life, through the ups and the downs and the scary people that came their way, God was with them and he led them and he brought them to the promised land. But the people, they quickly lost their trust in God and decided that having a king like the other nations was the best thing for them. They had really, really fallen away from the truth. And this broke Samuel's heart, but it also, even more so, broke God's heart because his people, whom he loves, had turned their backs on him again. Now it's easy to look at the Israelites and think to yourself, what are you guys thinking? What are you doing? Have you not learned? But honestly, we do the same kind of thing. Every time that we get jealous of somebody else because they have something that we don't have, it shows that we're not, you know, thankful and we're not content with what God has blessed us with. And every time that we get really worried because, you know, maybe something bad happens and 
um, your mom or your dad, maybe they like lose their job and you're not sure that they're gonna be able to like, you know, pay all the bills and that kind of thing. Or maybe, I don't know, with all this um, crazy COVID thing with all the numbers going up, we get really worried that we're gonna get sick and something bad's gonna happen. But we don't need to be scared and worried we need to trust in God and trust that he'll take care of us, that he'll provide for us. And even when the bad things do happen, that he is still in control and that he's using even those bad things to teach us something new, to make us who we're meant to be. And ultimately to bring glory to himself so that other people would know that he is good and amazing and incredible even when things aren't amazing and bad and incredible. And you know what else we need to do? We need to keep our eyes focused on God and focused on eternity because eternity, that lasts for uh, forever, it never ends. So even when we're going through really scary things or hard things, we know that it's just for a short moment. It's like one little drop of rain compared to the whole ocean, right? We have all of eternity to look forward to in paradise where there's no sickness and there's no dying and there's no tears or any of these bad things. If you're in God's family, that is something we can look forward to and keep on thinking about. And that is definitely something that we can be thankful for this year, even in the midst of all the craziness that we're experiencing. All right, so I hope that that means something to you. I hope that you have trusted in God and you continue to trust in God with your life because it's the best thing that you could ever do. And when you mess up and when you don't trust in God, ask for forgiveness. Just like our um, verse that we're memorizing, right? Ask God to clean your heart, to forgive you, and he will. That's another amazing promise. All right, so um, that's all I got for today. I'm gonna go uh, head out into this crazy world and I will catch you guys later. Peace.